Uh, thank you, guys. Good evening, everyone. Perhaps good morning, if we have anyone from across the ocean. Uh, it's an honor to be here. Thank you for uh, giving me this opportunity to uh, give you this talk and present uh, the topic that I called Deep Learning on the Inside. So this is basically uh, based on my everyday work uh, since I started working for Intel. And I think uh, I've gathered some um, interesting aspects of what deep learning is under the hood. And hopefully it will uh, somehow let you understand what's actually going on when we are working with deep learning and uh, with models. So. Uh, I started working for Intel a little over two years ago, and uh, I've come across a lot of frameworks and technologies along the way. So those four are in particular the big projects that I contributed to. Two of them, NGraph and OpenVINO, are Intel projects. Onyx is, an, is a community standard, uh, and Intel also contributes to, to it. And Onyx Runtime, uh, that's a project uh, created by Microsoft that me and other folks from Intel also contribute to. We integrate Intel uh, software with it. So uh, if for any reason any one of you would like to get in touch with me, here's my LinkedIn account and my GitHub account. You can find me there. All my work uh, for Intel is open source. It's actually available on GitHub, so you can have a look more or less uh, what I'm doing. And uh, let's dive in. So I wanted to start uh, the talk by some theoretical uh, consideration about what artificial uh, neural networks really are. So when you actually start learning about it, you will most likely encounter this kind of representation. So uh, this obviously is a graph. We have some nodes, we have some edges, and this is a kind of representation where we have those vertical layers and their layers are uh, composed of neurons doing a simple uh, sum, weighted sum of its inputs. Then usually the activation function is applied and the data is passed from the input layer through the hidden layers in the middle up to the final output layer. And this is obviously fine, but this is a rather trivial example that uh, you normally uh, encounter when you start learning. But when you finally uh, get to the point where you actually take some pre-trained model or you train a model yourself, uh, you're, you will most likely encounter this kind of representation. This is actually a snippet uh, from a faster RCNN model. And uh, it's also a graph, but it's uh, very, very different from the previous representation. And this is something that me and other people are working on every day. And uh, if we try to compare those two representations, so as I said, both are graphs, but uh, it's the, the fundamental differences are the nodes in the graphs on the left in those real life models are operations. And in, those, uh, in this previous representation, we had individual neurons working on, on a single, uh, on a single um, value, so to speak. So then we have edges in both representations, but on the left we have something called tensors, which, has, which are basically um, some structures containing more than one weight. It's, uh, it's basically a container for the data that the op nodes are operating on. And on the right we had those individual weights basically representing a single number. And finally, the graph as a whole uh, in real life models are sometimes called computational graphs. And the ones on the right are like linear graphs with layers. So uh, before we get to the graphs, I wanted to do this uh, exercise, theoretical exercise, and uh, consider if we can think about a model as a function, like a mathematical function. And suppose we have this simple uh, problem, simple, uh, of classification of images. So uh, we suppose we want to take any photo, fit uh, a model with this photo and get an information if there is a dog or if there isn't a dog in this, in this particular photo. So uh, in theory, we could create a mathematical function that takes this image or any image as its input. So here it's basically this single variable X and the output should be one for a dog and zero for not a dog. So it's kind of like hot dog, not hot dog from the Silicon Valley TV series. So yeah, sounds simple, but what happens if you fit the model with 
an image like this one. So uh, you might not really get the answer you're hoping for. So a model is kind of a function, but to be more precise, a model is actually an approximation of a function. And it has a certain accuracy because uh, when you get the output of a model, it actually gives you a probability distribution. So it says that the photo presents a dog, but the model is like 96% certain that this actually is a dog. And uh, this is not just my impression. It's actually something that comes from the universal approximation theorem. And a part of that theorem that, is, that was most important or most interesting to me is that it, those theorems imply that neural networks can represent a wide variety of interesting functions when given appropriate weights. This means that uh, a single model can actually approximate a function, but those, fun those functions can actually be different depending on the weights that we actually give them. And uh, if you think about it from a C++ developer's perspective, uh, you can actually kind of uh, map this theorem to a template function. So suppose we have this linear function, function template, but both of its arguments are actually numbers, so non-type template parameters. And depending on those two floats, A and B, uh, if you instantiate this template, you can actually get different functions. And this is more or less what happens with, uh, with a model. When you first build it and it's untrained, it can actually approximate, I mean, from the functional perspective, it will approximate some particular function, but those functions will be, can behave differently depending on the data set used for training and, and so on. So this is my kind of impression, how you can think about a deep learning model from a C++ developer's perspective. But if you're not a C++ developer, but like a generic developer, then you can think about it in a slightly different way. And uh, this is more or less how we can imagine a deep learning model. Uh, as I said, the graph contains data and operations. And here in this overly simplistic example, we have a very linear graph uh, where the data flows from the top to the bottom through those uh, operations. And if you map it to function calls, then you can think about the model as a composition of functions. And this kind of representation uh, actually makes a lot of sense to me when I'm thinking about the training of the model, because there we actually have to employ uh, the partial uh, derivatives of, of, of the loss function. And it has a lot to do with the composition of the functions if you look at the theory. So this way you can also kind of imagine uh, what a deep learning model is uh, underneath. So that was uh, the first section. If Are there any questions so far? Um, I have not seen any questions so far. Okay, thank you. So let's carry on. Okay, so uh, we had this exercise and I hope you believe me that you can imagine a model as a mathematical function or an approximation of the function. But before we go to the graphs, I would like to recommend this uh, tool to you. It's uh, created by Lutz. I think he works for Microsoft somewhere in Germany. And he created this awesome tool called Netron. It's available on GitHub. But as I was working on those slides, uh, I've also discovered that this tool is uh, available in your browser. So using this tool, you can actually open a model that you can download from many places and look at it graphically. You can click around, look at the operations, uh, how they are parameterized and so on and so on. So awesome tool free to use, uh, free of charge, and big thanks to, to Luz for creating that. Okay, so uh, we went from a deep learning model to a function, and now uh, let's try to uh, imagine a function as a graph. So for this uh, exercise, let's consider this sim simple linear function. So mathematically, it contains two operations. There's uh, addition and multiplication. Obviously, you should also, you, you should first multiply uh, a and x and then add b so we have some rules about which operation go first and which goes later and uh, as a matter of fact we can represent such a function with a graph so uh, we have this computational graph uh, just, uh, just as i said uh, earlier and first we are doing the multiplication uh, of a and x then the output of multiplication is uh, input of of the addition operation plus, of course, this b. And the final, finally, the output of add is the output of the whole function. So that way, uh, if you go through this uh, 
theoretical uh, example from the model to the graph, uh, you can start thinking about it that it all somehow makes sense altogether. Um, <clears throat> Uh, and this is, in fact, the truth. That's that's uh, what a deep learning model is. It's uh, very much about the graphs and numbers and operations. And uh, I would like to say a little bit more about the elements uh, that are used uh, to actually build up the graph. So, as I said, in, we have uh, nodes and edges. So nodes are called operators or operations. And uh, the Example operators that are used in particular in deep learning are convolutions or poolings or this top K operation, concatenation of various tensors, activation functions like real, for example, or uh, reshape uh, operations. So it's actually a ton of them. Just the ONIC standard uh, define, currently defines about 166 operators, and they actually have versions. So uh, you have to multiply the number of operator by the number of versions and uh, you can kind of imagine how many operations altogether we have to deal with. So those operators, which are nodes in the graph, uh, have also inputs and outputs. Uh, sometimes there are very simple operations that just take one uh, input tensor and produce one output tensor. But the situation is uh, varies between operators. You might get uh, ops with uh, two or more inputs and the same about the outputs. Uh, and operators have also attributes, and they actually modify the behavior uh, or parameterize the behavior of the op. And for example, uh, there is a very common attribute called axis, uh, which indicates, indicates the dimension in the data tensor that the operation uh, works over. And uh, if you think about the operators from the code perspective, they can be basically expressed or implemented as just simple pure functions or classes that very much depends on the particular operator that you're working on. So those were nodes. And then uh, the other part of the graph are, uh, are the edges. And in those real life models, the edges uh, represent just n-dimensional data arrays. So basically, Arrays, just like we have in C++, for example, they can contain various types of data. It actually depends on the framework, which data type uh, data types the framework supports. But it's important to know that they actually have this di dimensionality aspect. And uh, underneath, uh, in, the, in the memory, there are actually flat, contiguous blocks of allocated memory, because that's how the memory uh, works in the computer. And usually, it's flat and contiguous. So uh, to express the dim dimensionality of this data, since in, in memory it's flat, but we want to know that it has some extra dimensions, we use this term called shape. So uh, examples of shape, uh, I have two examples here. So it, it can be as simple as a two-dimensional matrix, three by three, or uh, this other shape, the long longer one, uh, is a typical input shape of classification models, for example, ResNet50. And here uh, it, it is like uh, one by three by two to four by two to four. And those individual numbers in the shape are called dimensions and uh, they can be divided into two groups, either static or, or dynamic. And static basically means it's a known number, but the situation became a little bit tricky when some dynamic models were invented. So that basically means that from inference to inference, the shape of the input data might uh, differ. And that's, in some cases, a problem for framework implementers. Uh, and there's also one more feature. It's called the rank. It basically indicates how many dimension, dimensions there are in a shape. So the first shape is four-dimensional. The other example shape is two-dimensional. So that's the tensor. So we have two building blocks of, of the graph. And suppose we want to build a graph like the one here on the left. So it has only a one operation called reduce sum. It operates on a two-dimensional tensor uh, with a size two by three. And it's supposed to reduce sum. So basically add up the uh, data, but over axis uh, number one. And it's supposed to produce uh, a single a 1D tensor with two elements at the end. So if you want to somehow map it to C++, we would probably create a data structure called a tensor, 
we can fit it with these six numbers as in the example. And additionally, uh, the other argument is the shape of, of the data tensor. This is uh, how we can get the information about the values and allocate those six numbers underneath and how, somehow uh, store the information about the dimensions of those six numbers. So if we uh, output this kind of data to the console, this would look more or less like, uh, like this here. We would have just a matrix with two rows, three numbers in each row. And if we would like to uh, implement the operation itself, then we would probably consume this data tensor parameterize it with an axis. Uh, so in, in this particular model, the axis is equal to one. And that means that we are supposed to add up the elements uh, of the internal, um, internal dimension, the mm, deeper dimension. This means that we are basically taking the first row and the second row and adding uh, those uh, elements element-wise. Actually, I described the other example. So, uh, Actually, it, uh, reducing over axis one is a vertical reduction. Um, sorry, it's actually a horizontal reduction and uh, it produces two numbers. And, uh, and the reduction over axis zero is a reduction of those uh, rows. And that gives us three numbers all together. Sorry for the confusion. Okay, any questions after this section? There are none so far. Okay, let's carry on. Okay, so uh, uh, if we take all this information uh, together, then we can build up the graph and uh, somehow store it as a model, train it, and uh, at some point we would like to get to the inference. This is the part uh, that is used by those framework that I'm working on. And basically this means that you're taking a model that is already trained, know, knows how to do its job, and you can use it in your own application. So you have this model or, or this graph, and uh, let's say you would like to implement uh, some uh, form of inference, and let's start with uh, some approach called naive uh, implementation. So the first step is to actually um, figure out a way in which order the nodes uh, of the graph are supposed to be executed. And uh, in this very, very simple example, I have five nodes. Suppose I had a graph with some topological structure. And what I'm doing here is something called topological sort. So basically, you're mapping the graph to a linear structure. So STD vector or whatever that contains those nodes in the order uh, in which they are supposed to be executed. So there are uh, at least two algorithms that can be used for, for this. Uh, I think depth first search is the most popular, but basically whatever you use, you just you're just supposed to produce this linear uh, representation of your graph. So when you have the graph sorted, then you obviously need the implementation of the operators. So as I said, for each of those operations, you need a free function, a lambda or a class depending on, on the operator. You basically open the specification, write the code, and you're good to go. When, you have, when we have those two, uh, um, two things done, then we can actually proceed to the sequential execution of sorted nodes. So uh, first the convolution takes the input data, so for example an image, produces some output, feeds it to ReLU, and so on and so on, until the very end of, of, of your sorted graph, and uh, at some point you get the output. But uh, it's called naive for a reason. Uh, you're probably wasting a lot of hardware potential because uh, this kind of implementation probably does not utilize all the cores that comes from the aspect of sequential execution. You're probably not, you're probably not using the vectorization, especially if you're using some non-compiled language. And that would be a big win, especially if the input data is multidimensional and contains a lot of uh, numbers. And in general, this kind of approach is called naive. It's because it's not good for, for like real life models. Uh, they are much more complex than that. They operate on a really large amount of data. So definitely naive implementation is not the way to go here. So what can we do to uh, actually do something better? And uh, like a primary way to optimize uh, our inference is to use the kernels and uh, kernels in general can be called highly specialized functions or primitives. Depending on the library, it can be named differently. 
And uh, those kernels the, or those functions are very, very much hardware specific. So I remember I once attended a vectorization uh, training and the key takeaway was know your hardware. If you want to know, if you want your code to run quickly or performantly, you should definitely know your hardware. That's why kernels are hardware specific. Uh, so they basically make use of the knowledge about the architecture of your hardware and the avail available instruction set. Uh, so it may vary uh, between CPUs and GPUs, uh, but this is what, ker what kernel implementers actually do. Kernels can also be specialized for data type, types or data shapes. It makes sense to write separate kernels, for example, for integer data and for floating point data. And at the same time, you might want to create a different implementation for two-dimensional uh, tensors and for three-dimensional tensors. Uh, it involves, it usually involves some mathematical knowledge about the operation and the data, but this is what happens as well. And an example of uh, a library that provides such uh, specialized functions is called, currently called 1DNN. It used to be called MKLDNN, then for some time DNNL, but the current uh, name, and I think uh, this one is going to stick, is called 1DNN. And it provides kernels for both Intel CPUs and GPUs. And this is something that is actually used in OpenVINO uh, to uh, maximize the performance of the inference of your models. And uh, this particular uh, library is also open source and free. It's available on GitHub. And I have an example here. So let me just quickly open that. So that's more or less uh, how it looks. And if we look here, we actually have this XBIAC uh, library uh, added, which does some just-in-time compiling of, of, of the kernel. And if you start browsing this code, you can actually see a lot of instructions that are quite hardware specific. Uh, it's long code. I don't want to focus on it very much. Uh, you will get the link to the presentation itself uh, at the end, so you can uh, have a look uh, by yourself if you're interested. OK, uh, and um, using the kernels in, in the framework in which the model was uh, initially created and trained is sometimes called direct optimization. And it's done in, in many, many uh, existing and popular frameworks. Uh, and basically, it's all about uh, getting performance from applying specific kernels for specific hardware in some deep learning framework. But there is a problem, actually. There is, there, there is already n frameworks in the market, and there are m hardware platforms. So if you multiply them, there's a lot of work. And basically, hardware platforms are invented uh, over time, and frameworks number actually increases as well. So basically, the, <laughs> the, the product of those two numbers also grows, so it's even more work. But there's one more uh, problem. We have K operations. Like I said, in Onyx itself, it's 166 operations. So if it's in supposed to be implemented in each framework and it's supposed to be performant, then we're actually getting even more work to do. And it's actually quite repeatable from one framework to uh, another. And uh, there is one more problem. Perhaps uh, something hardware independent can be done if we're talking about optimizations. And yes, this can be done. Uh, but before we go further, I um, would like to ask if there are any questions. Mm, there's one question regarding your Netron screenshots. Mm, uh -huh. okay, the person asks, um, because your screenshots show a description of the nodes, is that a, is that a feature specific only to the installed version? Or how come because the person didn't see it in the online version? Uh, actually, Netron evolves quite a lot, and uh, it has added a lot of features from one uh, release to another. So what I would suggest is to uh, first down, try to uh, up update your uh, version of Netron, but there's also this uh, view menu, and there you can display attributes of operators and names of the tensors uh, that are between the operator op operations. Uh, for some formats, you can also see the data shapes. So perhaps this is where you would like to go. Okay, thank you. And one more question from myself. 
Um, earlier you mentioned this one DNN library. It's mm -hmm. Intel CPU and GPU specific. Mm -hmm. Can it also work because Intel CPUs are mostly x86? Would it also work to some degree on AMD or what's it, for example, the limitation here? Actually, I haven't tried it on a different platform. I mean, especially because I'm working for Intel, I'm also developing on Intel hardware and I don't have access personally to, to for example, AMD processor. So I, I, I unfortunately, I cannot uh, answer this question right now. Okay. All right, thank you, that's it. Thank you, okay, so let's carry on. <clears throat> okay, so uh, now we can uh, switch to a more concrete uh, section about a particular library and particular implementation of everything that I uh, said before. And in particular, uh, I'm going to at some point present you some uh, of those hardware independent optimizations because kernels are uh, very much hardware specific. So NGraph is actually uh, a project that uh, I, that was the first uh, project that I joined when I joined Intel AI. And I have three links here. The first one is a PDF uh, of a paper, uh, just a two pages long paper about what NGraph is and why it was um, created in the first place. Uh, so uh, I can recommend having a quick look and <clears throat> In the very beginning, uh, NGraph was developed under this Nirvana Systems uh, GitHub uh, users group or, or, or whatever GitHub uh, names it. But uh, after some reorganizations inside the company, NGraph was actually uh, integrated into OpenVINO and stripped a little bit. So it doesn't uh, look uh, just like it looked in the beginning when, when it was originally developed uh, before before the merge and i'm going to talk about this a little bit more later so <clears throat> from the technical standpoint uh, what is ngraph it's actually a library so it's not like a tensorflow or pytorch it's not a full uh, full framework uh, used to build the models so it's a it's a library that you can integrate with your application and uh, just like that it was integrated with OpenVINO, and it's 90 something percent C++ inside, but it also has Python API, uh, which you can use to uh, um, to build the ngraph graphs, but I'll, I'll get to that in a moment. <clears throat> From the functional standpoint, uh, ngraph is actually hardware independent intermediate representation of deep learning models. <laughs> That's a long name, but uh, I'll uh, elaborate on that in a moment. Uh, and also ngraph, since it has uh, some internal representation of all the models, uh, it's also called a graph compiler. And uh, that was actually a surprising thing to, for me that so there are compilers that work on graphs and I don't mean ASTs for code, but graphs representing deep learning models. But, and since it's a compiler, uh, it's actually also an optimizing compiler, just like uh, GCC or Clang. And I'm going to present uh, examples of those op optimization uh, optimizations in a moment. <clears throat> and uh, I put those slides about deep learning model as a function uh, for, a, for a reason. And in ngraph, a class representing a graph is actually called a function. So that's why I think it's worth to consider that. So that's the original um, architecture of ngraph before it was integrated into OpenVINO. Uh, the middle is actually the IR, the compiler, and uh, some optimization uh, utilities. The thing above this middle box uh, are called used to be called frontends, and all of them were stripped except for the Onyx uh, frontend, and this is actually something that our team is responsible for. Uh, we are uh, making sure that Onyx models can be imported and uh, compiled to ngraph uh, intermediate representation. And uh, before uh, it was merged with OpenVINO, uh, everything below this middle box uh, that we used to call backends, those were actually uh, the second, that was all, each of those backends was the second step of the compilation. So first we were compiling from a framework representation to ngraph representation and doing some uh, hardware independent optimizations. And then this optimized graph could be then passed to a backend using something called a transformer. 
And this transformer was supposed to further compile this pre-optimized version to a par particular and specific hardware. So at some point, this, transform this transformer was actually selecting kernels for operations and doing a lot more stuff to make sure that the performance is uh, as, as good as possible. <clears throat> so now actually everything below this uh, middle box is stripped out and OpenVINO actually has a similar architecture. And the things that we used to call backends in ngraph times now are called plugins. The set of supported uh, hardware is different actually. So for example, NNPT and NNPI, that were, uh, those were uh, AI specific hardware accelerators that were manufactured by Intel. But again, th there was a reorg and those hardwares are, are not uh, supported nor produced any, anymore. So now, uh, if you're interested in using Intel software into your, in your application, you should have a look at OpenVINO and its documentation and supported hardware platforms. Okay, uh, so I mentioned those graph optimizations. So again, uh, ngGraph is a graph compiler and it can optimize the graph. So what is important here is that those optimizations are hardware independent since the intermediate representation is uh, hardware independent. And actually, uh, perhaps you have noticed some uh, similarities. Engraf was actually heavily inspired by LLVM. It's, it also contains IR and uh, there are some uh, IR optimizations that are hardware independent. So <clears throat> this is more or less what Engraf does too. They operate on and graph, graph representation called and graph function, as I said. And uh, long story short, graph optimizations are uh, all about looking for some patterns uh, that we can, that we know that we can replace with something more optimal. And that is hardware independent. It usually relies on some similarities between hardware platforms that will be used later. Uh, but not all the time. Uh, and depend, sometimes it actually depends on a particular model. Sometimes you have to take a particular model and even create a model specific transformation to make sure that this model uh, performs well. And uh, just like in LLVM, those optimizations are uh, called passes. In this particular case, it's function passes because they operate on a function. And those things are actually repeatable. So uh, the thing is that uh, one single type of optimization might be executed over the same graph uh, many times because some parts of the graph during the first pass might get optimized and that could actually affect the uh, parts of the graph that are below. And that's why you want to um, execute them many times, uh, even the same optimi uh, optimization a couple of times one after another. So the first uh, example of, uh, of an optimization pass is called implicit broadcast. So uh, in this overly simplistic example, again, we have a single multiplication and we have two by uh, three by three matrix and we're supposed to multiply it by a scalar. So if you take a piece of paper and uh, try the Mm, theoretical mathematical approach, you would probably do nine multiplications, uh, five by each element of the matrix and output uh, three by three mat matrix multiplied uh, by this single scalar. But uh, this is something that is not really optimal and uh, I had this uh, in this naive implementation uh, when, I, when I mentioned that vectorization is probably not utilized. So, uh, Given the fact that a lot of hardware today, if not all of the hardwares, use uh, vectorization, then you can actually prepare this data in advance. So instead of doing nine multiplications one after another, you can broadcast this first uh, scalar uh, to match the shape of the second input of multiplication. And then those nine uh, multiplication will be done let's say in parallel or maybe in one, one uh, CPU cycle or, or, or just a couple of cycles. But still, this gives you some kind of performance boost. And uh, again, this is a super simple example. So nine numbers is uh, really not so much. And uh, if you're doing that for a tensor that contains like 15,000 or millions of elements, this actually makes sense to do these kind of optimizations in advance. There's another type of optimization, and as far as I know, this one uh, gives a huge performance boost uh, in case of many models, and it's called constant folding. So since we are in, in C++ developers uh, group, 
This uh, is very much like uh, the const exp uh, things that we have in uh, C++ and const eval that was added, I think, in C++20. Basically, the ability to execute an operation during the compilation time, not during the actual runtime. So in this uh, simple example, we have this multiplication and addition. And uh, what we're looking for in the graph is an operator uh, that has uh, its inputs con uh, connected to some constants. So basically, from the deep learning perspective, you would look for inputs uh, with weights that were trained during the training. And if such an operator uh, contains only constants at, at its, or, uh, in, connected to its inputs uh, in the model, then you can actually um, perform this mu multiplication uh, while you compile the graph. You can remove the node uh, from the original graph and enter the result of this multiplication in, in its place. And that way, when we actually get to the inference, final inference of, uh, of your model, you won't have to do this multiplication uh, every time. So basically just, um, just like const expressions in, in C++. And uh, this optimization, uh, I don't remember the numbers now, but honestly, this was a, a huge boost for many, many models. Another example uh, is called, uh, in ngraph in particular, is called not elimination. You could also call it uh, no op elimination. So basically elimination of useless nodes. So what's a useless node? Uh, suppose we have a conversion operation. So like static cast from int to int. This makes no sense, but it will actually require the framework to allocate an input tensor and output tensor and copy da some data. So you're wait wasting CPU cycles, you're wasting memory. Such operation can be just removed from the original graph uh, without consequences. Uh, broadcast or reshape when target shape is equal to the input shape. Again, uh, if you have a three by three matrix and you're supposed to reshape it or broadcast it to three by three matrix, it makes no sense to waste CPU cycles. Again, something you can get rid of. Uh, another example is a reduction without a given axis. So for example, this uh, uh, two by three matrix that I've shown a couple of slides before, if you don't give the operation an axis, then by definition, this operation is supposed to just return its input. Again, wasting CPU cycles. And to dump it down, uh, addition of zero or m multiplication of one. So basically a mathematical approach uh, with this uh, value that is, um, I'm not sure about the English word, but this, this, that, the value that doesn't affect the operation itself. <clears throat> so those are uh, just a couple of uh, optimization techniques. And again, I've attached a link to uh, more, and there's plenty more. If you have a look at this particular file, which is a part of OpenVINO, you can see all the optimizations, I mean, most of the optimizations that we have in the in the software, some of them are very interesting, like fusion of operations, because it turns out that if you fuse two nodes into one, you can do it more performantly than just doing one operation after another. And so this is sometimes possible. Uh, there are optimizations called decomposition, and this is actually interesting because if for uh, any reason some hardware cannot uh, execute a single operation in a single kernel, then you can try to decompose it to a subgraph. So basically to a set of operations that do exactly the same thing, probably not as performant, but still functionality, this, uh, functionally, this model will be uh, executed. So this is uh, the file that you might want to have a look if you're interested in more types of optimizations. And now is the time for questions, if there are any. Mm, there was a question about the IR representation, um, but it was answered in the chat, I think. So, but okay. I have a follow-up question to that. It's at what kind of level does this IR, um, what what does it represent? For example, this constant folding. Other things you you mentioned make make it sound like it's very hardware, very close to the hardware. So we're thinking about instructions, uh, what kind of assembly one we want to produce. But at the same time, we're still thinking about um, graphs and models and kernels. So how does this differentiate itself, this uh, compiler, from something that, like Clang, what does it do differently? OK, so here is an important, uh, two things are important. Uh, so in ngraph in particular, 
whenever we add a new operation to uh, something called an offset, so basically a bug of operators that we support, we also add a reference implementation of this operator. And that's basically pure C++ code without any hardware specific uh, instructions used in it. And that way we can compile it on many platforms and uh, basically infer a model even on non-Intel CPUs. But also uh, another uh, thing that we use it for is exactly this constant folding uh, optimization pass. And that means that we are able to execute uh, this operation, not very performantly, but when you compile this model, you're not uh, focused on performance yet. So this is kind of like pre-processing of this model using this pure C++ code on basically any uh, platform. And then uh, this pre-optimized model is sent to the hardware and the hardware uh, plugin can also do further optimizations, including constant folding, which might uh, use a, a kernel for this particular operation focused on the hardware. Uh, but it also might use the reference implementation if for some reason it uh, decides that this is the way to go. So though this constant folding, as I said, it's a part of a generic set of optimizations and they are hardware independent uh, by definition or by assumption. So th thank you. Maybe <laughs> just to get a bit more down because I maybe I'm not fully understanding it yet. So. How does it differentiate? How does, what's the difference from run first running it through ngGraph and then later through other tools to immediately taking your model in, based in your framework? And this, let's say you have some model code written in C++ using TensorFlow, and then TensorFlow also calls compilers, which also optimize uh, based on like an IR representation. What's the difference of adding this additional step in the middle? What kind of advantage does it uh, give? So actually, I have a short video at the very end of the presentation that explains uh, how ngGraph is supposed to resolve uh, some problems. And it's mostly about not doing direct optimization in every framework. So it's like, for, for example, TensorFlow and PyTorch and three hardware platforms. So you have to do uh, six uh, combinations uh, all together to make sure that everything is performant. And uh, ngGraph was supposed to be uh, a helper for that, uh, at least for Intel's hardware. And that's why it also introduces its own representation. So basically, each framework has its own representation of a graph. So ngGraph is like another one. Uh, but uh, the idea behind ngGraph, uh, I think I haven't mentioned that, is that you don't build uh, your models in ngGraph. You should just import them using those bridges. Uh, and just execute. You don't build uh, layers or ju just don't build the graph uh, in, in Python like you would normally do in TensorFlow, for example. I'm not sure if, I, if that answers your question. Oh, it does, certainly. Um, so and if I understand correctly, this would enable, let's say, uh, someone writing, implementing PyTorch or TensorFlow to add new operations and not think too much about implementing it on this like product of different uh, on this like large sets of different hardwares they can target mm -hmm. but just um, target but just output something that can be fed into ngGraph which then knows how to specify as best specialize it for the different hardware that's right and uh... Again, if you think about LLVM, this is also the kind of approach. LLVM can basically consume any language uh, with some compiler that can produce LLVM IR, and then the LLVM backends can transform this in hardware independent IR to particular hardware uh, representation. And that's more or less how ngGraph was supposed to be placed in the AI frameworks uh, realm, so to speak. All right, yeah, thank you, that answers it. <clears throat> Okay, let's continue then. Uh, okay, and then I wanted to actually show you a, a bit of C++ code finally, uh, how it's done in, in ngGraph. So this is not, an in, not a class diagram, it's how an ngGraph function or a graph uh, looks uh, from high level perspective. So uh, since it's a function, it has parameters. So parameters are actually inputs uh, of such a function. You can also attach a constant, which is basically a representation of a weight from any, any framework uh, as a function input. And function produces results. So it's a lot of uh, uh, references to, to the maths. Uh, 
And uh, here it's a class diagram. So uh, when you want to build a graph in a graph, so the function represents a graph, but it's slightly different from other frameworks where you actually have a graph object that kind of controls the lifetime of its nodes. So I'm, I think it will be uh, much more understandable when we go to the next slide. But before, we, before that, when we build the graph, the top level uh, class in here is a node. So you can create uh, graphs using nodes, obviously. And there are two uh, main classes that derive from node. One is called op, uh, which is short for operation. And all the actual operators that ngraph supports derive from an op. So it can be a convolution, a simple addition, activation functions like relu, but also parameters and results uh, derive from op. Uh, and this is how we build the graph itself. And what is interesting, uh, the other class that in inherits from node is called a pattern. And that thing is actually used to build up those patterns used by the optimizers. And uh, this is how you can create, for example, a particular node like convolution and other uh, primitives that uh, inherit from pattern are, for example, any input or constant and, and so on. And that way you can create various types of patterns depending on what type of optimization you are trying to implement. And there are some pattern matching algorithms in ngraph itself, but unfortunately I really don't have time to explain uh, all of that because that would probably require a separate presentation. But still, you build up a pattern, pattern matcher uh, finds this pattern, and then you can replace it, modify it, and uh, do all those optimizations that we have in ngraph already. So that's more or less the class diagram. And uh, let's say I have this particular uh, simple example. Let's try to create a simple function like this one in ngraph. So uh, this is particularly a screenshot from Netron uh, created from an Onyx model that I, uh, that I just built up uh, in my console. <clears throat> so this particular function is supposed to do three things. It's supposed to add two tensors, uh, but one of them is uh, a, tensor or a tensor of integers, it's two by two matrix, and the other one is a scalar. So the things we have to do here first, addition operation by definition operates on the same data type. So we either have to add floats or uh, integers. So in this particular example, I selected to cast int to floats. And this is what the cast operation does. It preserves, preserves the data shape and passes it as an input to add. Okay, and then uh, since we're adding a two by two matrix and a scalar, then what we should do is uh, is this broadcast because we know this will um, make it more performant. And actually addition doesn't re even require this uh, implicit broadcast optimization. Uh, by definition underneath, it will actually do the broad broadcasting by itself as long as the shapes match. And something to research if you're interested, uh, it's a feature of NumPy library, it's used in Python, and it, does a, uh, it has a lot to do with broadcasting data. So in this case, if we have a scalar, which is basically described by an empty shape, uh, so scalars are basically broadcastable to, all, I think, every uh, other shape. So here, we know that those shapes match and we can do this addition. So finally, when we add those two matrices, which will also be produce our uh, two by two matrix, we would like to reduce some this operation over two axes. So we have two by two, we have two available axes and we're reducing over both. And in that case, this particular operation is supposed to produce a single number. So in ngraph, this is how it would actually look. So uh, we had two inputs to the graph. Uh, first one was this two by two uh, tensor of integers. So, uh, oh, something that I haven't mentioned before. Uh, the graph that we built is based on shared pointers. And don't ask me why, <laughs> uh, I, I haven't designed it. I actually discussed it uh, quite recently with one of the original authors. And he actually admitted that perhaps there is an overuse of shared pointers in ngraph. But still, it works. I find this architecture really interesting, and I like it a lot. So uh, despite all the cons of shared pointers, I think that was a really good choice. So we operate on shared pointers. And first, we create two shared pointers of ngraph parameters. And those parameters uh, are supposed to be typed. So as I said, we, are, uh, we were supposed to create a 2 by 2 matrix of uh, int32s. 
and this is what the first line does. Then we create a similar input for the scalar. That will be the input to, to the addition operation. So then we actually uh, can do this addition, but before we add the scalar to, to this 2 by 2 matrix, we are supposed to do this casting. And uh, there is a slight difference here. In ngraph, a cast operation, an onyx cast operation, is realized uh, using convert operator. It's a different name. It might have a slightly different syntax, so there might be some tricky parts we have to do when, when importing those uh, models. But basically, this is this first compilation step. The ngraph bridge is supposed to compile the onyx representation, for example, to ngraph representation. And this is what we do. Sometimes we just match uh, an operator. Sometimes we do a lot more. So when those are ready, uh, oh, okay, so the conversion operation takes this in data and it's supposed to uh, cast it to float 32. When this is ready, then we can feed the add operator with both inputs. Uh, so this is what uh, addition will do. As I said, it has this NumPy broadcasting enabled by, by default. You can parameterize it uh, to use another type of broadcasting, but I think NumPy is the most popular. <clears throat> And then finally, we are supposed to reduce sum the output of addition. But this reduce sum operator uh, needs another type of parameterization. And uh, as we have seen in this previous slide, we need to tell uh, reduce sum which access it's supposed to reduce over. So for that reason, we create an ngraph constant. Here it's a little different syntax because constant is a kind of special uh, operation. And here we have a helper factory function that takes the data type, uh, the shape of, of the data that is supposed to be enclosed in the constant, and finally the values. So this is basically the syntax of reduce sum, the data to reduce and the reduction access. And that's it from the graph perspective. So when the line with reduce sum is executed, we have the graph, but it's kind of like hanging in the air, it's not attached to anything. So finally, we build the function object, which will kind of hold the graph uh, using a shell pointer as well. And since this simple graph has only one output, then we can create the function by giving the final node directly to, to, the, um, to the function constructor. But if your graph uh, has more than one output, then basically you just have to pass it as a vector or an initializer list uh, as a first argument to the function. And then uh, there is this extra thing that was kind of confusing to me in the beginning. Uh, you also have to specify a, a parameter vector to the ngraph function. And this is because uh, the order of those inputs is important. Many frameworks actually take inputs by the name, so it doesn't really matter in which order they are passed in, but ngraph does it slightly differently. Inputs also have names, but the order in which you provide the parameters is important. So here you could actually replace those two, but then uh, during the inference, when you pass the data in, you should remember that the first input should be a scalar and the other one should be the two by two matrix. And there are situations where this is useful, uh, but in this simple example, that's basically it. And uh, so that was the simple uh, C++ function, uh, sorry, ngraph function. And I did some exercise and I tried to, let's say, compile it by my own hands to C++. And I created some code snippet like this one. So <clears throat> here I created this kind of, uh, a kind of compilation to some hardware that is supposed to use pure C++. So uh, here, for simplicity, I just hard-coded the input data, a two by two matrix. Uh, in this case, it doesn't really matter that the shape was supposed to be two by two. It's basically a vector of four integers. And the scalar is literally a scalar, uh, but that's our input data for simplicity. So then, as I said, we need this uh, implementation of operators. And in C++, you can do it by just defining lambdas. So uh, in case of the cast operation, we can use the vectors constructor and just basically take the ints and cast them to floats and return this vector by just uh, using the utilities from the language itself. <clears throat> then the other operation that we needed was the addition. So we, are, we were supposed to add a vector of floats and a float scalar. But as I said, we need here we actually needed to do some broadcasting. So uh, let's say I had some 
optimizer in my head. I, I, I knew that this is an element-wise uh, operation, so I didn't really bother about the input data shape. So the broadcasting is basically a creation of a vector that matches the size of the data and is filled with those uh, single fives. So basically we're getting four fives in this broadcasted vector. And since we are good C++ developers and we like STL, then uh, we are going to use an STD transform here. And we're also doing some memory optimization. We're not allocating another buffer for the result. Uh, we're actually reusing this broadcasted uh, uh, buffer here. So this is where we're going to output our operation. And we use this uh, simple helper, helper STD plus for floats. And there we go. There we have the implementation of addition. And finally, uh, re the reduce sum that does re reduction of this vector of floats. So basically, it's over both axes. So it's supposed to add up all the elements to a single number. Again, STL, STD accumulate because we like STL. And there we go. We have three functions. We have our data. And finally, we can execute this function. So just like in the first, uh, in the previous slides at the beginning uh, of the presentation, this is this composition of functions I told you about. You can execute the casting first, then the output of cast and the scalar is the input to the addition. Output of the addition is the input to uh, reduce sum. And finally, we get the result and the result is 30. So that's it. That's, let's say, uh, a compiled version of uh, an Engraph function. It's a totally useless model, uh, but uh, that, there you have. There, there you go, there you have it. And um, just one interesting fact, when Ngraph was a standalone uh, engine or framework, it actually had this ability to generate a code like this. So basically you could uh, import an Onyx model or any supported type of model and run it over the CPU backend. And instead of inferring the function, you could generate C++ code. So you could basically get a C++ representation of any supported model. And you could, for example, attach it to your C++ ap application in an optimized uh, version already. So that was actually an interesting feature. OK. Do we have time for some backup slides or some questions, if there are any? Oh, there certainly are questions. Uh, you seem to have <laughs> uh, interested the people of all the C++ now. Um, <laughs> any special requirements of Intel chip hardware for the uh, Ngraph um, library or to use the full capabilities? There's also a, a little note on DNN USB stick, for example. Uh, okay, so Ngraph itself, as I said, at this moment, Today, this is basically a graph representation and graph compiler with some optimization capabilities. You won't be able to execute this graph with ngraph itself. It doesn't have those backends anymore. So if we are considering ngraph uh, by itself, it doesn't really rely on any specific hardware, but uh, usually it's used on the host. If you're thinking about sending the graph to, to GPU or some FPGA even or Movidius, then, uh, yes, this is uh, where you have to look for supported hardware. But this is a, um, a list of hardware that you can find in the OpenVINO uh, documentation. And graph itself cannot execute this graph, so it's kind of hardware independent. Okay. The next question is, um, what exactly are the disadvantages of using shared pointers uh, on slide 35? Uh, so one thing that many people complain about is all those atomics underneath. They are not really important at the point where Ngraph builds up a graph. This is sequential, this is single threaded, so you don't really need all those uh, atomics underneath. And as we all probably know, uh, there's no re real way to uh, do it in pure C++ STL implementation of shared pointer to, to drop those atomics. So that's one disadvantage. But uh, I've heard a lot of complaints uh, about usage or uh, the, the need to use those shared pointers to build an ngraph function. But I don't know, maybe people just don't like to type make shared. <laughs> I'm sure some other people have interesting opinions. I remember some uh, time ago in an after talk chat, there was a vivid discussion about shared pointers. So I would suggest the person that asked this to join the after talk chat. And yeah. 
Um, there will be, I hope there will be discussion about it. There's a further I question. Hope so. <laughs> Um, does n-graph create a temporary vector matrix tensor for every operation or does it perform lazy evaluation similar to ranges? Good question. And uh, I think the answer is the second, but not entirely because n-graph doesn't uh, create tensors at all at this moment because uh, when we have the graph itself, we don't have the tensors yet. Tensors are actually allocated in the plugins where the actual inference happens. So uh, previously, when ngraph had those backends, the tensors were, uh, were also allocated in the backends, not at the graph level. Uh, and similarly, this is the case for the OpenVINO plugins. Okay, thank you. Um, and one last uh, question. The, so this ngraph library that you talked about, um, it had this support for C++ output, and that's what you showed us right now? Uh, this output that I've shown, that was basically me typing in, the, in this uh, website, uh, but uh, this code generation support, it, it was a mode of CPU backend uh, operation. It was called CodeGen. I think it was a, um, a, a string parameter or an enum parameter that you could pass when you wanted to create this uh, CPU plugin. And then the plugin knew that it was supposed to create C++ code to some and store it in some file instead of actually compiling and inferring the function. It, it wasn't expecting any input data. It wasn't expected to produce any output data from this function. It was supposed to produce code and save it to a file. But mm -hmm. unfortunately, it's gone. OK, so OpenVINO now no longer supports this. It directly generates assembly. No, unfortunately not. But if you look, for, look at the original repo under Nirvana systems, I think this is still there. OK. And one new question came in in the meantime. Uh, can n-graph calculations be distributed among multiple machines? Mm, yes. Uh, in n-graph itself, there was this distributed execution mode. I don't remember if it was uh, for inference. It definitely was the idea for n-graph uh, in, in, for training in n-graph because uh, back in the original ngraph times it was supposed to be used for both inference and training and there was this uh, distributed approach uh, at least uh, implemented at least to some extent uh, but in case of openvino i know there is something called a hetero plugin and uh, it's not about distributed uh, to you know to uh, to divide the workload uh, this plugin uh, actually partitions the graph uh, depending on the capabilities of the plugins because if you import a model and there is some weird operation that a particular plugin cannot execute but some other plugin can, then this single node can be offloaded to the plugin supporting it and the rest of the graph will be uh, inferred in the original plugin. So it's not the same, but there is some way of distributing the workload in this particular case for unsupported operations. Okay. Um, you asked also if there's some time for uh, additional slides. I think uh, 15 minutes, 20 minutes should be fine. Okay, so I'll try to make it quick, but I actually like this section a lot and I think it might be interesting for many people. It's called quantization. Uh, it's also a form of optimization, uh, but a little hardware related, but not so much. And it's actually about optimizing the model itself. So quantization as an operation is a, uh, uh, is a mathem mathematical formula that you can write like this. It takes a real number, r, it divides it by a constant called a scale. So for a particular quantization uh, approach, the scale is, uh, um, is a constant. Then the result of this division is rounded down. And additionally, you can add something called a zero point, which is basically an offset of, of the range that you're going to produce. So if you look at this uh, picture down below, uh, we have some range from minus 1000 to 1000 and uh, suppose we take some scale and some zero point uh, in this case for simplicity the zero point is equal to zero and if you choose a scale for example 10 and divide all the numbers by 10 and run them down this is the other range of values that uh, that you're uh, going to produce and this is actually sounds simple uh, it has some drawbacks but actually, it makes sense to consider that and actually to implement that for your models. But before we go uh, to the details, 
suppose we have uh, we need to figure out the uh, available range of uh, numbers that you can fit in a single float and uh, i'm talking about float specifically because that's like a data type of choice for deep learning model weights uh, you very often uh, or always train your model in floats. Sometimes it's float 16, depending on the model, the, the various approaches, but float is like the, uh, the first data type that you choose. And here we can see that the range of available values is actually pretty huge, from 10 to the minus 38, up to 10 to 38. And the um, um, resolution of those numbers is actually very, very fine. So you can, uh, squeeze the numbers that are very, very close uh, to one to another. And uh, let's consider another data type, so int 8 uh, in particular. So four times smaller in, term, in terms of uh, occupied uh, memory, but obviously we reduce the range of available numbers uh, and the this resolution uh, changes quite a lot. So the resolution here is basically one. That's the minimum uh, distance between the two consecutive numbers in this range. And uh, similarly for unsigned version, uh, unsigned numbers are, are also uh, used in, in deep learning models. So here obviously we have the same number of values, uh, but uh, you can start from zero and end uh, at 255. Uh, so given uh, this fact, if we consider quantization of this uh, set of real values here in the left column. So for simplicity, I have this symmetrical uh, range from one, one, minus 1000 to 1000, and each and every value in this column is distinguishable from each other. So suppose those are the weights that we got at, at the end of the training of our model. So <clears throat> again, for simplicity, I'm just leaving 0 point equal to 0. So what we are supposed to do when we want to quantize this uh, range of input values is basically divide by some scale and round it down. And if we do it for scale two, we end up with a range from minus 500 to 500. We start increasing the scale. So the range also gets uh, kind of compressed. So quantization is actually kind of a compression. Actually, it's very often called a compression of a model, but a very, very important part of this compression is that it's lossy. So uh, in this original range, look, uh, we had a zero value and 1.618. So those were two dis distinguishable values. If we choose a scale of four, which is not a very big number, we're actually losing information here. After the quantization, those two values are actually equal to zero. So there is this loss of data, just like when you compress a JPEG image and you move the slider too much to the right, uh, some distinct, distinct pixels uh, in one area become one patch of the same color. So that's more or less uh, uh, how the quantization looks. But if we keep increasing the scale, we are going, finally going to find some value of the scale that lets us fit this range in a smaller data type. So those things can be fit in a float, maybe float 16 if you, if you want to use that one. But when we choose a scale of 8, we're finally uh, getting a range that can be fit in int8 uh, data type. Obviously, it has to be done with caution, because if we choose a scale of 50, then four numbers become uh, indistinguishable. So you might suffer from overusing the quantization, but more on that later. So suppose we chose this uh, scale of 8 and quantized our model, and this is what we get in our weights. And why would you even consider that? So this is an interesting uh, uh, picture I took from uh, Intel out article. Yesterday I checked it, unfortunately the link is dead, so I can't refer you to, to the original uh, article. But if you look at this, uh, for example, addition of two floats, uh, it takes 0.9 picojoule, and if we switch to int 8, uh, the number is way smaller. And it's the same for multiplications. But also what is interesting, uh, the area of silicon on a chip that you need uh, is defined for all of those operations. So if you want to implement them, you actually have to consume some, uh, some area for those operations. <clears throat> so quantization benefits. Uh, if you switch from floats to int 8s, for example, then obviously, as we've seen on the previous slide, you can use less power. And this is actually super important for so-called edge devices, 
So for example, a deep learning accelerator that you can mount on your drone to analyze the data from the drone's camera. Uh, the chip can be smaller, but I mean, those were micro square meters. So you don't really save that much, but still, if this is a, a thing that you care about, then you can produce a smaller chip. But from, I mean, from a C++ developer perspective or any developer perspective, you actually can get a better cache utilization. And uh, this is because those models actually operate on huge amounts of data. And the biggest model I know is called uh, GPT-3. And as far as I remember, it co only the weights in this model uh, take 350 gigabytes of memory. So imagine how much um, RAM or graphics cards you need to have in your rig to actually load this model, not to mention the inference. So in that case, if you have so much data, then you are probably interested in getting as much as them, uh, as much as possible of, of those numbers in a single cache line to increase the number of uh, cache hits. So if you have one float uh, or four int eights uh, in the same uh, space, then obviously the cache utilization will be better. Also, from the storage of this uh, model perspective, smaller weights actually produce smaller models. So if your model, the original model, takes up one gigabyte, then after quantization, you can go down four times, so down to 250 gigs. And this might be important, for example, if you're planning to deploy your model on a mobile device. And again, we get performance boost. And this is an interesting part. Uh, but to actually get the performance boost, you need hardware support. And uh, until quite recently, that was available on Intel Xeons only, quite expensive processors. I cannot afford one myself. Uh, but the instructions uh, that were added in Xeon generation two are called AVX512 VNNI. I think that's ve uh, vector neural network instructions. Uh, there is a cool animation about this explaining that. Uh, you can read more about this in this Intel Deep Learning Boost article. Um, and some kind of article or more like white paper uh, about uh, using this uh, lower numerical precision to increase the performance. And as I said, uh, until quite recently, that was available in Xeons only. And I have actually checked and since the 11th generation of desktop processors, some of them contain this instruction set. So you can actually gain uh, if you're doing inference on your own laptop. So you might want to look for this uh, type of instructions when you're buying a new processor. Okay, and finally the performance boost. So uh, the comparison here is between uh, a model that is not quantized, that this, light, that this light blue color as a baseline, and the quantized version, uh, depending on the model, was like 3.8, uh, the worst one was only 2.6 times faster, but that's still a pretty big speed up. Uh, and theoretical limit is uh, a number four because you have four uh, integers uh, instead of uh, in place uh, of a single floating point 32. Uh, so obviously, according to the Andal's law and other uh, things, you probably we probably won't get four times speed up, but 3.82 is actually a pretty good uh, result in my opinion. But uh, where's the catch or is there a cost of, of such approach? So basically this cost is called accuracy. We would expect that if we lose information that we gained by training the model carefully, we would probably drop the accuracy of the model. So it will not be able to uh, recognize a dog uh, at the 96 certainty percent level, but maybe something like 50%. As a matter of fact, the accuracy drop is very little. It's actually less than half a percent point. Uh, this is always uh, this always puzzles me that Inception V3 is actually doing better uh, when it's quantized, but the difference is so small that it could be actually an error done during the performance measurements. But this part of the graph is uh, also al always very interesting to me. So uh, I think it's important uh, to consider quantization if you're. Uh, if you have any doubts or, or if you're interested in any of those per gains that you can you can get from that. And this is something that OpenVINO actually provides. There is something called POT, uh, which translates to Post-Training Optimization Tool. 
And this is how you can quantize your own model with some kind of feedback loop, so it does it iteratively. And basically, that's all the material I had. So uh, this is the link to the presentation. It's hosted on GitHub pages. Uh, I'm going to post the link uh, somewhere to the chat as well. Or if, you, if you guys can uh, pass it to Twitch, that would be awesome. And before we finish, definitely, uh, this is the video I was talking about. Uh, if you're familiar with the YouTube channel called uh, Kurzgesagt, uh, they make some animated videos about various types of uh, stuff. And this video was done in, in a similar way and ex explains why ngraph uh, was invented and how it was supposed to help you when deploying your models. Uh, and since I like learning and I like sharing some useful materials, I have a slide with some materials for you. Uh, there are some references to OpenVINO, to its documentation, its source code. Uh, also, some locations about uh, w from where you can download the models if you would like to deploy them in your application. So you can take some pre-trained, pre-optimized uh, models for Intel hardware uh, specifically. You can get some models from the Onyx standard itself. Uh, those places are, by, uh, by the way, called uh, model zoos. There is an onyx.ai uh, website of describing the Onyx standard. Uh, if you're into AI or you want to start learning, then this is uh, Onyx is expanding and growing very rapidly. So it's basically a standard already ad adopted very much. So Onyx is something to get familiar with. And if you actually want to start learning, I very much recommend this uh, neural nets series from Three Blue One Brown. I think it's four videos uh, introducing the neural nets and a course, amazing course on Coursera by Andrew NG. This is something that I've done myself, that, it let, that this, this course actually let me start uh, working on AI. And finally, uh, you can have a look at infoshare.pl. It's, uh, I think, the largest tech conference uh, in, in the region. I'm not sure if it's going to happen this year, obviously because of the pandemic. Uh, but actually, InfoShare, for, uh, in the couple of uh, most recent uh, editions, uh, was very much focused on AI and deep learning. So there are some recordings on YouTube, and hopefully there, there will be another edition. So it's hosted here in Dansk. So you never know. Maybe we'll, we'll meet someday. <laughs> so thank you for listening. That was deep learning on the inside. And uh, are there any questions? Um. No, there are no further questions. There's one little uh, ask that you show the link to the slides again. So I'm sure, uh, sure that people are interested in that. Um, I think we will post them uh, later on the Meetup page too. So yep. thank you so much for giving this talk. It was wonderful having you. you. And uh, for everyone that's interested and that wants to talk to Tomas directly, uh, please join our after talk check chat. It's a Zoom meeting. We will post a link in the Twitch chat and you can just join and uh, have a good time. And we will Thanks see you again. again. Bye.